Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I don't know what that was. My name is Chris Ferry, and this is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today, we are both very excited to be talking to you about the 1980 sci-fi horror movie about which I had never heard before, Saturn 3. All right, do you have a synopsis for us, Mr. I Robert? do. Now, Saturn 3 is not a, it's not the third film in a series. There's no Saturn 1 or Saturn 2. It's just Saturn 3. Uh, a madman, Harvey Keitel, and his shiny robot chase a, this is, a, I actually really like this synopsis. I just found this and I had not read this before. A madman, Harvey Keitel, and his shiny robot chase a May-December couple, Farrah Fawcett and Kirk Douglas, Doing food research on Saturn's third moon. I love that. It, it sounds a little bit like a, a review that an AI wrote. You yeah. know. Yeah. So Mad what did Man you think? And his shiny robot. I love that <laughs> little a May December couple too. Like that's so. I like that. Quaint. Um, yeah, I had never even I had never even uh, heard of this movie before you brought it to my attention, and you showed me the movie poster, and I and then I watched the trailer. The poster that like, we initially saw is amazing. We have to do that movie, yeah. uh, and we have done it, and we are now doing it. So and we each said, "There's no way this can live up to the poster," and right. spoiler alert, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, had you seen it before? I had not. So my this is one of those movies where I don't know if you remember or not. Do you remember with HBO when if you subscribe to HBO, you would get a little booklet in the mail, a little paper booklet that would tell what, okay, okay so HBO, that. and I don't- Like I, a TV I'm, guide. Now you get an email that's like what to watch. Yeah, but they used to have a little, it was a little paper booklet. And I always like to look through those for whatever reason. And uh, when I was a kid, and I can remember- uh, whenever this movie came out on HBO, you know, it was probably like a year or so later. And there's an image of the robot, uh, and this happens in the film, but there's an image of the robot has, is picking Farrah Fawcett up by her throat. And that was the picture that they used in the little HBO guide. And I can remember as a kid thinking, oh, I don't, this movie, this is probably a dangerous movie to watch. You know what I mean? Did you ever have movies like that as a kid where you were like, you would see the box, the cover art or whatever, and you would think, I don't, if I watch that, I may be permanently scarred or changed or whatever. And so that was 1980. Yeah, that, that one looks upsetting. Yeah. And that was what I thought of this. It's like, oh, that that's not a movie that I, and you know, I was whatever we were in 1987 years old, six or seven years old. And this was rated R, so I wouldn't have been allowed to watch it. But it's it's always been one of those movies that was in the back of my mind somewhere that I always thought, oh, I would I would like to see that someday and had just never watched it. And I thought this was something this is in the the wheelhouse of our show. So, yeah, I'd never seen any of it, but I always thought, oh, that might be a really amazing movie. So what do you think? I. It, I had a lot of questions. There were a lot of things in this that I didn't, that I don't feel like the film answers. So very early on in the film, so the very beginning of the movie. So it starts out and the first five or 10 minutes, I was really with it. I liked the, some of the production design. They were clearly ripping off Star Wars. You know, there's a, you brought it up. The opening shot is the big ship, like the Star Destroying, Destroyer going overhead. And you have these, they're astronauts or pilots or whatever that we show running around. And they have black helmets that look very much like Darth Vader, I felt. And so Farrah Fawcett and Kirk Douglas are on this base that's called Saturn Three, I guess. And there is a guy that is supposed to go to the base and Harvey Keitel kills him. The, he kind of sucks the guy into an airlock kind of a thing. And that was actually, I thought, one of the, the best parts of the movie is where that guy got chopped up. It was a really neat effect. And I thought, wow. Yeah, so, let's, so he opens okay, an airlock. So there's like a locker room yeah. where the guys are getting changed into their spacesuits or whatever. <laughs> 
And the guy that's going sees Harvey Keitel. He's like, oh, yeah, you get, uh, I heard you got uh, marked as unstable on your psych test or whatever. And he's like, that sucks. But, uh, you know, them's the breaks or there's a silver lining or something. And, and Keitel just walks over to this like emergency airlock and starts to, you know, it becomes clear that he's going to open it. He's still got his helmet on. The other guy's like, hey, hey, no, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right? And so he opens it and the guy gets sucked out. The vent is uh, where the ceiling would be. He gets sucked up and there's these sort of um, guy wires crossing the space. And it, I think the idea is that his body freezes solid mm -hmm. as it goes up the shaft and hits those guy wires, which just shatter him into pieces chunks that go venting out into space but what i love is there's a, a there's like an emergency airlock in the locker room that you could just vent the locker room into space basically by pulling a lever i'm like that doesn't seem like it meets any safety protocols mm -mm. this is everybody has access to it yeah so, or, so that was a something like effect. this could happen right <laughs> yeah. and so, so nobody catches on to him there's no alarms or anything that goes off for an emergency vent because they're like literally like it's like an airport. They're like, Captain whatever, report immediately to Anger whatever for immediate departure. Mm -hmm. So he goes and runs there on the guy's place with a helmet on. Nobody sees who he is, and he gets in the thing and uh, and blasts off to go down to Saturn Three, which is going into radio blackout. It goes on the far side of the moon or something for like – what six months or I don't so, yeah, know something like that yeah there's large periods of time yeah. when they're completely isolated and it's a it's two person unit we're going to meet them it's a man a woman and a dog that are on this kind of um i don't know why a food development station is on the far side of one of saturn's moons but that's the deal um and that's how the whole thing is set up that you know, all oh, the cell phones don't work out here in this cabin in the woods. There's no reception. Well, we're going to be on the dark side. So there, he is going into a situation where we know from the very beginning, there's going to be radio silence for a protracted period of time. So there's this ominous note. This murderer is, is hijacking a ship. Uh, we know he's mentally unstable. Uh, we haven't met anybody else yet, but it's not a bad kickoff. No. As a premise, right? No. But so that was my first question, and maybe we can come back to this later, but do we ever know what his motivation is? I mean, did he know who they were? Or I never really understood why he wanted to go there. I interpreted it that he... Uh, He's just crazy? Just a God complex. Okay. Just wanted to build this new generation of a robot that relies on so the robot that he's building uh they call it the demigod series or whatever and it's huge it's like 10 feet tall it doesn't have a head for some reason it's this big vaguely human looking thing with cables and pumps but it has this huge canister that's full of cloned human brain tissue so it's like there's this giant thing that's maybe several feet long and you know yay around that's just full of like a giant brain in the jar and that goes in the center and then there's all these sort of things that look like veins and arteries all up and down the legs of it that pump this blue and red fluid that supposedly support this brain and then there's an interface the doctor puts in the back of its head to sort of teach the robot stuff and part of the problem is, is that because the guy is unstable, the robot is unstable. The robot kind of inherits this guy's instability, but his instability was just kind of, to me, some version of psychosis. Like they did a psych test. They determined that he wasn't stable and we see that he is not stable. His priority seems to be you know, creating this robot kind of more or less in his own image, taking control. He is a control thing. He wants to control the station. 
he falls. He, Farrah Fawcett is Farrah Fawcett. She's young and he's gorgeous. infatuated with her. You know, and he's he so her. yeah. So he wants her, and she's not interested. She's in love with Kirk Douglas, who is definitely old enough to be her father. Yeah, he is. I looked up the ages, and he is. I believe he was sixty four when they made the movie, and she was thirty three. Um, and he's in, you know, for 64 years old, he's in really good shape and they, they do this kind of odd, you know, I'm sure like he worked out a lot for the movie, but they do this kind of odd thing where they show, they want to show him naked in it. And, you know, and it's, and she's naked a little bit too, but it's just like, were people really going in this to see Kirk Douglas naked? I don't know. (laughs) But so you, so my next question that I had about Harvey Keitel is, so he oh and so you brought up the robot and the robot is as you said it's humanoid and overall it looks pretty cool except as you said it has no head it just has these little eyes like a camera thing so it looks silly why they didn't it could have been a really scary uh robot with a head (laughs) but otherwise you know the way they have presented it it looks kind of ridiculous yeah Yeah. And I mean, one of the fun things for me about this movie was I like watching old science fiction movies because I like seeing what they think that, you know, seeing their vision of what the future is going to be like. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Blade Runner is a perfect example of Blade Runner. That's supposedly 2019 Mm -hmm. as as imagined from 1980. Right. When was Blade Blade Runner was 82, 82. Okay, it's from the early 80s. And of course, you know, you watch it in 2019 and you're like, okay, so we're still not there. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of this is wrong. Still yeah. an entertaining movie. But in the 70s, especially after Star Wars, you know, th- there's a lot of uh, like the decor of their bedroom is it's like I space. Loved that. It's also kind of modern, like what late 70s, early 80s would have been considered like cutting edge fashion. There's a lot of kind of uh, lamps that have multiple necks on them and they have kind of bulbous, you know, ends where the light bulb is and the neck and the furniture is kind of chrome and white leather. And, you know, they have some version of a water bed and, you know, it's, it's things like that. I'm not going to lie. I really liked that. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, this is what they think. Uh, they didn't say what year it was, right? So it didn't. I don't they think didn't, so. No, they didn't say like this is the year twenty one sixty two or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the other thing I love is so you know it's, there's always going to be a shot of the guy in the spaceship or the guy launching the spaceship or the control panels of the spaceship, and it's all um, physical switches and buttons, right? There's no graphic display. It's not. We talked about this a little bit with Tron, where mm-hmm down in the lab where they're actually making this crazy technology it's beige computers with click a clack of keyboards and black screens with green cursor there's no graphic there's no gui there's no graphic user interface it's just you know the green cursor but but the ceo's desk is a giant ipad Mm -hmm. like the ceo's desk is this it looks like this 80s desk where it's all like black glass and then he sits down in it and he says you know password whatever and it lights up and he's got his keyboard and everything is the desk and i was like yeah you you got it like that's that's right on the money the future Mm -hmm. would be so in this though it's like the guys are all like ready and it looks like apollo 13 is like click 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 and then there's a you know a bunch of little Instead of little LED lights, they're little physical lights, like there's a little bulb and it lights up red, it's blinking red. And um, they just, their imagination at that time couldn't imagine a purely digital future where the interface would be, right? Because television at that time wasn't even like that. Like the screens that they had were these vacuum tube screens. So the idea that a wall or something could be a screen. Yeah hadn't even occurred to them. Um, And I really love that stuff. I love the stuff that feels like this is a motorcycle helmet that they kind of spray painted, but somehow that looks pretty cool. 
Like, I, I mean, I don't know. I could go with that. I'm not that particular example, but you can see, your brain can see the low rent thing that that is, but your imagination kind of goes, well, why, why couldn't it look something like that? Like if you look at the SpaceX, the suits that the SpaceX astronauts wear, they are functioning spacesuits, but they look uh, evocative of the kind of thing you see in movies like Armageddon or what, whatever. Like they, they have a kind of a modern sci-fi streamlined. They're not the great big, you know, moon landing, mm -hmm. deep sea diving things anymore because they don't have to be. Uh, anyway, I, I digress a little bit. I just, a part of the fun of this movie was the world they built mm -hmm. and the ways in which it looked kind of cool and science fiction and plausible and the ways in which it looked like what lazy people imagined the future looked derivative. Like some of it was ripped from star Wars. Some of it was like alien some set designer who didn't have a sci-fi background. So they made it look modern to 1980. Um, you know, it's a real mashup of the look is a real mashup of star Wars and alien uh, because this yes. base that there's on and the story this, is closer to alien. Yeah, exactly. And the story I story is more like, yeah. And with the design, again, some of it being pretty cool, it suffers from seeing this in high definition on a big TV. You know, you can really see the seams and the, the sets look cheap. Whereas if you had seen this on video in 1982, it probably would have looked a lot better, you know, because right. the fuzziness would have been hiding a lot of this. So the next big question that I had is, and, and one of the questions uh, you answered and looking it up on YouTube or looking it up online was answered. So Harvey Keitel's voice is really strange. And, and all through the movie, I'm thinking, was he dubbed? Because this does not sound like Harvey Keitel. And you said like you immediately thought he was dubbed. And I looked it up. Uh, this was a really troubled production. They had all kinds of problems. And for whatever reason, I don't know what the answer was for this, but Harvey Keitel would not come back to do any post-production. And so they, they overdubbed all of his dialogue, everything, with a British actor trying to do a mid-Atlantic accent. So it's just like... It's and the dubbing is well done in that it never it's not like right. the words and the, his face don't match up. But it's just like this does not sound like a voice that would come out of Harvey Keitel, which well, now this, that we're familiar with Harvey. I was going to say now that we're familiar with Harvey Keitel, it doesn't sound anything like Harvey Keitel, like right. Harvey Keitel doesn't do accent work. Harvey yeah. Keitel sounds like, you know, the guy that, you know, from Mean Streets and and early Scorsese movies, he's a guy that grew up in New York and he sounds yeah. like Harvey Keitel. I mean, Sean Connery was a guy that didn't do accent work. There were some actors that just talk like they talk, whether they're in a period piece yeah. or they're playing a Russian submarine captain or an Egyptian, whatever, like they right. just talk the way they talk. And Harvey Keitel is one of those guys. But it lends to this really weird thing that goes along with the dialogue that he has in the film. So a little bit to fill in kind of a little bit more of what the story is. So we find out Farrah Fawcett was, was born in space somewhere. She's never been, she's an earthling human. I guess you'd say she's a human, but she has never been to earth. She was born off planet somewhere. Uh, Kirk Douglas is from earth. And so there's times where she's kind of asking him questions about earth or whatever. Right. She, so, this goes a little bit to the age thing, uh, the generational difference between them. But she's like, oh, what's it like? I always wanted to go. And he's kind of like, she's like something about, oh, uh, the fresh air. And he's mm -hmm. kind of like, well, <laughs> you know, it's not so, the air is not so fresh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, it's sort of like, believe me, it's not everything is cracked up to be. And by the end, he's sort of like, look, if you want to go, you got to go, you know, don't let me uh, you you got to go see it for yourself. But. but they are very much normal people in the way that they speak. I mean, they sound just like people today. But Harvey Keitel has such a weird delivery. And he immediately, you know, he's immediately like, 
a, a, you know, trying to be on her basically. And just like one of the first things that comes out of his mouth, you have a great body. Can I use it? You know? And it's like, that's what we say on earth, you know? And it's like, so right. I kept, so that brings up my next question. And this never plays out in the movie. As far as I could tell, I kept expecting him to be an alien or an Android or, but I guess he's just, a guy yeah. from Earth, you know what I mean? He never sounds like a normal person throughout the movie. He has this really bizarre way. And I don't know if it's like things have changed on Earth and everybody is like him or he's just a weirdo or what. But did, did you kept did you kept thinking there was going to be some kind of a twist that he was a cyborg or something? <sighs> I didn't, I didn't. Because otherwise I don't know why he talks the way that he does. You know what yeah, I mean? I didn't, that... So, so I'm, I want to go ahead and jump ahead to this. Okay, because sure. I thought that the very, very ending of this was confusing. Right. So we're, we're going to come back and talk about more stuff, but at the very end, so how it unfolds is he plugs in programs, the robot, the robot, um, like him is unstable and or defective. The robot becomes infatuated with the Farrah Fawcett character. And we end up in a situation in which it's three people in a closed, in lots of dark tunnels with a kind of a killer robot trying to get them and them trying to beat the robot. Mm -hmm. um, it's complicated because Harvey Keitel is not, he sort of loses control of the robot. And at some point they're sort of like, did the robot kill Harvey Keitel or is robot is Harvey Keitel now trying to help them shut down the robot. So it kind of twists and turns a little bit, but at the very end, um, what we end up with is like in alien Ripley, Farrah Fawcett sort of gets out and one way or another sort of ends up blowing up the robot and the other two guys are dead and, um, and she gets out. So it ends with her on this kind of commercial flight to earth. And she's standing in this sort of big, you know, it's like bay window of this big ship. That's a shuttle that's, that's heading to earth. And we see earth and it's a kind of a doctored image of earth from space. Um, and it looks dark. You know, I don't know exactly how to describe it, like the whole thing's been paved, but it's, it looks an altered image of Earth. And the music that comes on as this character whom we have learned has always wanted to go to Earth is now going to Earth after escaping this harrowing thing. And the music is ominous. The music is building to this like, that's when everything got really bad. You know, did you, did you? And I was like, yeah. what was so, so, so I had a number of thoughts. I was like, is that because earth is not going to be what she expects it to be? Or there was some indication that somehow before the end, when she overcomes it, uh, the two of them get subdued and are knocked unconscious and Keitel and the robot are still alive. And when they wake up, Kirk Douglas has now got one of the information ports installed in the back of his head. And there's an upsetting conversation over the intercom where it's like, it's time for you to return to work now. Um, and, and the implication of somehow I'm going to be inputting stuff into you. I'm going to be programming you now. And the, space people come around and they're checking in hey just making sure everything's okay down there and they run over and try to be like wait help and then their mic gets cut off and their voices are like everything's fine here and so it turns out the robot can emulate their voices and they go and they find out that the robot has in fact killed harvey Keitel and has cut his head off and stuck it on the stalk yeah and says something to the effect of like they're like, are you, are you Dr. Whatever now? And he's like, it's complicated. I'm Dr. Whatever. I'm, Do I'm you. I'm her. I'm all three of us. I'm everybody. So there's some sort of indication that like the people program, the robot can kind of absorb 
programming from the people and that somehow the robot could input programming into the people. And he checks the back of her neck and she doesn't have a port yet. And he's relieved and he ends up sacrificing himself to kill the robot. He puts explosives on him and he sort of tackles the robot into this water and detonates it. Right. And that's the, that's the climax. But I wondered if that, if that ominous music at the end is supposed to imply somehow that the robot has infected her somehow with its programming and that she's now going back to earth and it's going to be this kind of virus. The music was Mm. so distinctly ominous at the end. Like you, we see this in space movies where there's like, it's the Ripley character got away, but, but she's infected with the virus and they're all like, you know, you, the last thing you see in the movie is the astronauts being like, oh, wait, there is somebody alive in this chain. You know, well, no, there's still a heartbeat. Let's let's open it up and take her back down to the whatever. And you're like, no, no, she's infected, right? Yeah. That's what it felt like at the end of this movie. But I was like, what? There was no indication that that, am I crazy? No, no, I didn't really pick up on that too much. I, I guess I didn't think that much about it um, other than maybe... You know, he had, Kurt Douglas had said to her that like, oh, it's not all it's cracked up to be or whatever. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they were, what exactly they were trying to go for with that. To me, the music at the end was like one of those horror movies where the good, you know, you you know, in the traditional zombie movie, nobody gets away. Mm -hmm. In the in the in the slasher movie, there is the the final girl, or there's a survivor. And yes, it's horrible that all of her friends got killed, but the killer's killed and it's over. And the one person we've come to gravitate to has made it out. So it's the it's the sort of the happiest ending you could come to expect in what has been a horrifying movie. And then there's the other kind of horror movie that that doesn't have a happy ending, it has a bad ending, and they they twist the knife by letting you think it's over, but it's not over. Like somebody Mm -hmm. has already released the virus in the airport or, and so where they leave it is they leave it with you like, like uh, black Christmas, right? Mm -hmm. They leave her thinking they got the guy. And then as it pans out, we, we see him coming downstairs and as it pans out and then the phone starts ringing and we know, you know, the horror is, oh no, he's done it again and nobody else in the film is aware of it. We're the ones with the horrible knowledge. Mm-hmm. And that's what the music at the end of this movie, but it, it was completely confounding to me. It yeah, wasn't if there were resolution music, like she got away and now she's going to go do the thing she's always wanted to do and start whatever new life she has because she's still young. If they were going for that, they certainly didn't convey it well, you know, and that in reading a little bit about this film, the the screenwriter was really unhappy with this because they they threw out a lot of what was in the original script and changed a lot of things. And I and from what I understood, even um, when Farrah Fawcett signed on, she really liked the original script. And then they, you know, they changed a lot later. And I don't know if she was unhappy with it or not, but it just seems like the whole thing was kind of a mess. Um, you know, as they went in, they said the the director was, and I forget what, I'd have to look to see what his name is, but uh, he had not really done sci-fi before he'd done a lot of musicals and things. And they, I guess he got on set and somebody else had to take over because he kind of didn't know what he was doing, I guess. That's what I read. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know, but the, that part that you brought up about the Harvey, Ty, Harvey Keitel's head, I almost feel like they, they went with that goofy design of the little eyes thing just specifically so they could have that scene where he puts, and I don't know why it couldn't have been a head and he took it off and put Harvey Keitel's head on. I don't know. I mean, that was a fairly effective, fairly effective scene, but I, I think the so why would the thing, robot not, why would the robot be designed without a head in the first place? I, I, it right. Makes I no mean, sense, that's, just yeah. a, that's a more fundamental question. Like, why would you design this thing that literally has striations like human muscle tissue? It's mm-hmm. almost a, it's almost a Da Vinci 
yeah homage to you know this concept of it of it emulating the human form like it doesn't need this bipedal thing isn't super efficient for a robot right we see other robots in the movie that have treadmills and things and sure they have extender arms but this idea that it needs to look like a person is a pure purely human and it's not it's not a replicant it's not designed to be comfortingly human like indistinguishably human it's terrifying it's twice yeah. the size of us it looks like some ver- half stripped like the skin's been stripped off the human body but it's gleaming it's like who designed who yeah. designed this robot and it's got articulated fingers but the thumb thing it's almost like a blade it's a terrifying mm-hmm. robot yeah with no head you know, yeah. what I mean, it could have had some sort of a human head and it could have peeled the skin. Off. He could be wearing his face or something. I mean, you have lots of different ways you could have gone with it. Yeah. But I think kind of the the what potentially was the most frightening thing is what you brought up is towards the end where uh, Kirk Douglas has the port in the back of his neck and the the robot or Harvey Keitel or whatever. I guess it's a robot because Harvey Keitel is dead, but Harvey Keitel's consciousness or whatever can control Kirk Douglas now. And I just, in that moment in the film, I felt you feel kind of hopeless and you're just like, wow. I mean, you know, it's going to turn out okay for somebody, but I just remember watching this and thinking, wow, I, this is a really terrifying scenario where He's going to be able to control, or it is going to be control, be able to control everything that Kirk Douglas does. And I'm thinking, how are they going to get out of this? And then it's just, they pretty easily defeat him. You know what I mean? It was just like, it wasn't like, it wasn't much like, oh, Kirk Douglas is going to go against the orders and it's going to electrocute him or something. He just seems to be able to do what he wants to do. Right. You know what I mean? Did you, did you feel that way? So it's just like, that was yeah. really silly to me. It makes me it makes me want to state for the record that I didn't think this movie was terrible. Like no. I didn't think this was a lemon. I think it had its problems. And I think there's a reason why I had never heard of it before, even as somebody who was interested in doing movies from this era. Because I think it you say it was a troubled uh, uh, production. And I think that comes through. The, the, the final product seems a little confused it doesn't as a finished movie it doesn't seem super clear on what it is Mm -hmm. it's a horror movie but it's also sort of like sometimes there are kind of sci-fi dramas that are really just sort of an exploration it's more of a human story set in a future society and it explores how the human relationships might be slightly different in that context, but how they're sort of universally the same, right? Um, or it's an action movie where there's a foe and you have to overcome the foe. And this is more action horror than anything else. But it uh, there's a lot that is confusing and I think underdeveloped. Uh, Harvey Keitel's performance is flat anyway, but then having his voice completely dubbed by another guy who seems to be seeing the flat performance and emulating, he's like, oh, okay, so I'll do flat. So the voiceover is just not Harvey Keitel's actual voice, and it's not really adding anything to the performance either. You know, you know what I'm saying? Sure, sure, yeah. And Kirk Douglas is great. I mean, Kirk Douglas is a movie star, and he looks great at 60, but he and Farrah Fawcett, well it's plausible their chemistry feels um manufactured i mean they're yeah did that ever seem believable did Uh, that ever seem believable it told the story yeah right i mean i think they him he particularly was a seasoned enough actor that you know the performance tells the story accurately but there's certainly no spark and i think he's uh I don't think Farrah Fawcett is the greatest actress that's ever worked either. Um, but uh, she's not given a lot to do here. Then other she than isn't given. Like, to be fair, she's not to, given a lot to do either. Being but, fat, you know, you know, be in love with him and be scared 
of Harvey. Yeah, Pintel, his relationship with her. There's, I mean, the, the age difference. There is a sort of a paternal element to it. Um, oh, so this. Is, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Something that just popped into my head. That was another thing that in the beginning of the movie seems to be this very important thing that goes nowhere is he has these blue pills. Harvey Keitel right. does. And what do they call them? Blue bloomers or something blue like dreamers. that. Dreamers. Blue dreamers, blue dreamers. So he brings these on to the, the base and wants her to take them. And she's very interested in these. And she brings it up to, to Kirk Douglas. And he's like, oh, Blue Dreamers, you want to stay away from those? And then finally, there's a scene where they take them together. And it's, you guess it's like sort of a hallucinogen or whatever. And then Harvey Keitel interrupts them as they're, you know, I guess they're on this trip or whatever. And then nothing else ever happens with that. Apparently, so I didn't know what the point of that was supposed to be. Apparently, there was a cut scene mm -hmm. um, where they're tripping and that she's wearing this kind of Barbarella outfit. And that's on the poster. Yeah. And I saw the, the image of that online. Yeah. Yeah. So they trip and I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know if she has that outfit or she's imagining herself in that outfit or what that cut scene was. But if they set that up end, to be very important. She has that kind of curly hairdo like mm -hmm. on the poster and i think that's supposed to be some echo of neck now in the wake of him she's like mm. well maybe i kind of like that some elements of that or yeah yeah i don't know but with this i felt like there is there was definitely the potential for there to be something really good with this and i think you could have almost done this this almost i kept thinking watching this it's a very they don't really do a good job of presenting it this way in the film, but it's potentially a very claustrophobic environment because they're on this base and there are just these tunnels and that they go down or hallways that look very alien like with all the, you know, you have all the exposed wiring and everything. They have that, they have their bedroom and they have the, the room where they grow the plants in. And that's the whole thing. So you could almost do a shining kind of, because I, I just, you know, thought it would be kind of like people on a submarine. Um, you know, I was thinking, how long could you survive in an environment with it like this with just one other person, even if you're in love with that person and a dog and not right. start to go a little bit stir crazy, right? So you wouldn't even really need the Harvey Keitel character in this film. You could just have the robot and you could have one or the other of them go insane from just being, you know, and cause they've been there for years. Right. Wasn't that kind of the, uh, so you, I think one of my big criticisms of the film is there's very little suspense in this, you know, Alien is the blueprint for how you take this enclosed environment and have a monster in it and make it really suspenseful and scary. But in this, I just felt I was just pretty bored with a lot of it. You know, it's just like, okay, when are they going to have the big showdown with the robot? You know, and that's going to be the end. And, and that's pretty right. much how it plays out. So there's the potential for a really good movie here. Yeah. I, some of it plays like a thinker. Yeah. Right. Some of it plays like a thought piece that's exploring these, but none of the concepts about the September May romance, uh, none of the, you know, none of that stuff feels particularly deep. We don't know why they're together. It, you, yeah, you know. it doesn't, you know, it's not like that, that stands on its own as, uh, these profound ruminations of the human condition and I said like so if if it's not that then shouldn't it just be a straight up horror film and I think some of the horror stuff is really unsettling mm -hmm. some of the robot stuff and some of the concept stuff about now he's got a port in the back of his neck and what are this robot doing I think they do a pretty good job of making the robot feel like a non-human intelligence like it takes these kind of psychotic and, and the desire for the woman isn't a sexual one it's not like it's trying to impregnate her or something but it does have this obsessive controlling 
desire that it gets from the doctor, you know, that, mm-hmm. that I don't know how to explain this, but it does feel like that gets translated to this non-human menacing thing. And you think, well, that's not good. You know, like, I don't, I don't want this robot obsessed with me. Well, and they do, I don't know what it wants to do or how it's going to translate that, but it's not, I'm not going to like it, (laughs) you know? Well, they do come back to the, they, they continually come almost every interaction between her and uh, Harvey Keitel is the same thing of, Hey, you're hot. Remember? And if you want to get it on, that's what we're here for. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, every time he talks to her, it's like, that's what we do on earth. You know, it's I mean, really... he even says at one point, he's like, I'll give you a pill. You won't remember it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if that's the problem, I can give you a pill and you won't even remember it happened. And it's <laughs> like, like, you know, your boyfriend... like... <laughs> and it's just like, he's so upfront with it. Or it's he like... even says, he says, so she says, I'm with him. And he's like, uh, exclusively? Yeah. Like, that's criminal on earth. Like, that's, <laughs> he's, that's he's actually. Like, and it's just like, he's old and gross and I'm young. You know, wouldn't you rather, you know what I mean? It's just like, he's so direct and like, no. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Just that is creepy, you know, but that implanted in the robot, it, you know, makes it extra creepy. I don't know. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, in terms of would I recommend it, would you recommend it? I, 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 I thought it was an interesting watch. I, I mean, if you're into any of these actors' careers, if you're into, I was fascinated by it just from the poster and, and never having heard of this movie. I mean, it's certainly, it's a sci-fi movie that falls closely in the wake of Star Wars, which I think we understand sort of changed everything in sci-fi. Um, and so somebody was like, oh, we, there's a huge appetite for this. We got to, it's definitely not a kid's movie, mm-hmm. right? Which Star Wars definitely is. Um, but but it, also it, Alien was a big hit too. So it's, it's definitely trying to capitalize on that wave. And I think that alone makes it an interesting watch. And there is some stuff in it that feels original that I haven't seen before. There's a lot that feels derivative. And there's a lot that feels slow or mispaced or unclear. Mm-hmm. Um, so that this is never going to be one of my favorite movies. But I mean, I would say, hey, you know, if what we've been talking about sounds interesting to you, yeah, check it out. I, I think it was on Amazon and the commercials kept popping up, which bothered me, but it's it's free. I, I don't think I, I watched it on and I don't have my own account. I was using somebody else's, but I watched it on Peacock. It's on uh, the Peacock streaming thing. So with no commercials and looks, I don't know how the the print that you watched looked, but it looks great. Yeah, it, it looks good. Know, high def and, you know, really high quality. And like I say, it, it, it kind of, um, a lot of these old movies, you know, the high def kind of harms them in a way because you really can see the- Because it wasn't designed for that. Yeah, it wasn't designed for that. So you can see how cheap the sets look and everything. It's interesting in terms of these are certainly three actors not known for science fiction. I mean, I don't know if any of them, I can't think of Harvey Keitel or Farrah Fawcett doing any other sci fi stuff. I don't know if Kirk Douglas did some like in the 50s or 60s or anything, but, um, and I'm sure they probably. The fact that Fair Fawcett seemed, from what I've read, seemed very eager to do this. And with Kirk Douglas, too, I'm sure they probably thought like, oh, you know, sci-fi is cool right now. This will be a big hit. But the um, I read the budget was 10 million and it brought in 9 million. So and you kind of think 10 million at that time for a movie that literally has three characters in it. I mean, you only see one other person not in a helmet and that's the guy that he kills in the beginning so it's a very small cast you know so um you know whatever that would be today like 30 or 40 million dollars or whatever um so yeah and i also come back to the thing that i've i feel like i've brought up a hundred times is the the science fiction movies that still really hold up today, like star Wars and alien, it's almost a miracle that they, that they turned out as well as they did. And you don't watch, 
you know, you don't watch Alien now and, and think like, oh, they look really goofy. You know, these costumes are terrible, you know, whereas uh, this, there's definitely some of it that seems silly now. Right. But it's not a, yeah, it's, it was, a, I wouldn't say it, it was like a fulfilling a bucket list kind of a thing. But again, as I said, this was one that was always in the back of my head that I always wanted to see. Definitely. If I'd watched this as a kid, this would have really freaked me out. You know, so yeah, I wasn't yeah. wrong in my initial, uh, you know, my initial thoughts when I first saw the imagery from this, it definitely would have scared me as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have thoughts about what you want to do for next time? There were a couple that I saw just randomly looking at things today that are very different that I don't know. Have you ever seen a movie from 2006 called Smoke and Aces with Ryan Reynolds and Jeremy Piven? I remember the name of the movie, but I don't think I've seen it or know anything about it. So that was it came up on a, a poll that I saw today of movies that were released in January because January is kind of like always a dumping ground for films but there's been kind of some hit things so that was one and then there's another one that's really obscure that for whatever reason popped into my head that I've got to look up the just bear with me for a second um a movie called Zero Effect from 1998 it um has uh bill pullman and ben stiller have you ever heard of it or seen it um bill pullman is this kind of strange detective guy and uh ben stiller is his assistant and i haven't seen it it was a movie that i really liked at the time and i've not watched it since then um and so i don't know how it holds up but those were two that just kind of popped into my head i don't know if there's anything that you've thought about lately that no, I'm I'm game to do either one of those, frankly, if you've got one that's kind of hankering at you. Did you ever see Smoke and Aces? I don't think I've seen either of those movies. I never which, even the second one. Which would you rather see something that's like so Smoke and Aces is a real like stylized kind of action action thing and and uh this zero effect is kind of a quirky mystery thing. So I don't know what appeals to you more. You pick. Okay. How about if we would do uh, this zero effect? Because I know it's okay. it's been a long, long time since I've seen it. It's a, it's a strange movie, as I remember, but but interesting. It it might twenty years later, it might be terrible. I don't know. Zero <laughs> effect for next time. Chris and Chris talk movies at gmail.com. <laughs> If you're on our YouTube watching us, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much. Leave a comment. Um, if you're listening to us on the podcast, nice to talk to you again. Thank you for subscribing there. Um, we're on I had a listener question oh. um, about your, and you don't have it today, but the, uh, the kind of shield thing is that's normally in front of your microphone. Yay. Somebody asked me about that. What did they ask? They just said, what is it for? And I said, I think it's just a sound. Yeah. I, so I had oh, to rebuild okay. my computer and for whatever reason, it thinks it's full and I can't fire up my, um, my Motu board that powers the mic, which is why I've just been doing uh, the regular computer mic. But this is just a little attachment. I think I got this on Amazon as well. I'd that, never seen the other side of it. So I didn't know. What it what does it is it just keeps... So if I'm talking in front of this iMac screen, my voice bounces off the screen and can create an echo effect, bounces back and forth. And this, I talk and this dampens uh, any sound that goes past the mic. Okay. Is your mic, a, is it a USB mic or is it a, does it have to plug no, into? No, a... it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not a USB mic. Yeah, I has go to plug a into it. M2 box that connects to my computer via USB and uh, the mode two controls the gain and uh, I like it. Cool. Very nice. Yes, right, but of course, I'm not getting the benefit of it right now because my stinking computer, I got to get a new computer, but I think I'm, I'm kind of holding out. Um, I'm holding out until they come out with the next line of IMAX. 
if I can, because I know you just got a new one. Yeah, and my camera's way, way, way better. Than the Apple chip, which I like. But if they stay true to their kind of product line things, then maybe by later this year, they'll put out a 27 inch iMac mm-hmm. um, that has that's the, the plan, Apple yeah. chip. And I would like to get that. I like a bigger screen. If I can wait that long, if I can't, then I'm just going to have to cave because so, I don't know. This thing's only three years old, but it's been acting troubling. Yeah, my iMac was 10 years old, the, the previous one. So if I can just buy an and literally the camera or the, the iMac that I had before that, I had for 10 years. So if I can just buy a new computer every 10 years, I would be really happy with that. That would be great. But so that would be great. Knock on wood if I can get 10 years out of this one. Um yeah, I mean, I've rebuilt this thing twice now. And every time I rebuild it, the machine runs fine. It's my data. It keeps thinking that the computer's full. And I don't know if it is that it's my mail that's filling it all up. I like I look at the, I haven't solved this mystery yet, but I look at the thing and it says I've got, you know, between 50 and 100 gigs free on a terabyte drive. Mm. But I can't even, like I'm recording this to the cloud now. I normally record it to my computer because it just, I can't save anything to the hard drive. It Mm. says your drive is full. So I have to I have to figure that out. Just for fun, when I bought mine, I went on and priced out the uh, the tower computers, whatever they, I don't, I can't even remember what the they're Mac called. The Mac Pros, yeah. The Mac Pros. And you, and I guess, you know, the only people that are buying those are, are those are probably like studios are buying those to like Disney and stuff. But the, if you, I just priced it out with everything. It was like $65,000 or something. They start at like seven grand, I think so. You know, you could, Pixar, you could Pixar could make a movie on it. The, 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 they're yeah. such incredible. I used to buy Mac Pros because I wanted to do video editing and stuff. And it was just nice to have the processor powering for rendering and things like mm-hmm. that. But the iMac and the new chips have gotten so powerful that and like, I'm not doing yeah. full 3D CGI with like hair and each hair has its own algorithm and the mm-hmm. breeze and like, I don't need a Mac Pro. Those are so muscular. Yeah. Anyway. Anywho, that's so for next time we're gonna do zero effect. Zero effect from 1998. Join us. Anything else to add? I don't think so. Then we will talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>